We're in 2 Peter. Chapter 1 tells us a game plan. So Peter's writing to the Christians that are dispersed. Jews and Gentiles are dispersed. The time is he's in prison, eminent execution coming for him. And this is a very passionate book. That's one reason why I think I just got really into it this week. It's very passionate what Peter writes in here. And the burning of Rome either takes place right after him writing this, or it happened and he's writing to him. So you know persecution is just crazy on the Christians because they blame the burning of Rome on the Christians because they were just they weren't happy with them. So as we're reading this, that's what he's trying to get across is that, hey, there's stuff going on. And that's probably why he's so passionate because he knows he's about to die and he's worried about Christians. So he starts off the chapter with the game plan. Like if you look at first or second Peter, I, don't, I hope I said second Peter, second Peter, uh, chapter one, verse three, he says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So he's saying he's given us all things pertaining to life. That's how we live. And also all things for godliness. That's our spiritual stuff that's going on here. And he's saying, how do you get that? Through knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Where do we get the knowledge from? Well, the scriptures, yeah, the book, the Bible. That's where it's that's where we're gonna get that. So he gives us everything we need in the scripture. So that's what he's starting out, you know, telling the Christians, you know, get get into your get into your scriptures. He also says, now this would be a good if you're looking for something over the week as a Bible study, chapter one's really good because he gives us a game plan. Like, how are you supposed to live your life? He's like, all right, guys, follow this plan so that you won't stumble. Do we not want to stumble? No, we don't want to. It's a good chapter to be reading through. And I thought this is the one I was going to preach on. But again, that's not what ended up happening. So it's a really good, really good chapter for going. He gives a game plan for staying true to God and entrance to the kingdom of Yeshua the Christ. And that's in that first chapter. So he's saying, this is what you need to do to do that. In verse 20, he has a little bit of a, a change there because he's also saying that the prophecy that Yeshua is the Christ has been fulfilled. He is the Christ. He's been proven all sorts of ways. I heard, he even says, in there, I heard, I was in the garden, I heard God say, this is my son who am I well pleased. So he's, he tells him that. All right, so he goes, so this is the God. And he, he goes in verse 20, he says, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So he's saying all this prophecy about God is true because it came from the Holy Spirit. But then he's, he started, he's got a little bit of a change here because then he says, Interpretations from the prophets also are from the Holy Spirit. That's like his next line as he's finishing this. So all this stuff comes from God. And so he's leading in. Chapter 2 is about false teachers and false prophets. So he starts off with this you know, pep talk, like do these things, and then he switches it now. I'm going to give you a warning. And the warning starts in chapter 2. And he starts off this. He goes, but false prophets also arose among the people. So he's saying, back in the day, there was false prophets. Just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So it's not even a question. He says, there will be false teachers. So we don't, you know, it's not like, well, I hope we don't run into any of those. They will be there. And the part that's kind of crazy, like, we're, oh, yeah, I know these false teachers. We see them all the time. They're like health, wealth, prosperity. You know, that's, we can see it. The thing is, the scripture here tells us who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. The heresies meaning choices or teachings or a way to think. And so we're saying, dang. So the secretly coming in. So that's a kind of, well, well how, do, how do you pay attention? Well, we all, we've talked about this many times. You run through what you hear through the word of God. You've got to test that. We got to be testing everything. But he also says, and this is the part that really throws this section off, this, this little scripture, he says, even denying the master who bought them. So what do you mean he bought them? Well, 
It's saying these are people that are Christians. Okay? So we got Christian teachers, but he's talking about false teachers. How does that work? Well, part of this is that we hear like when people start twisting scriptures, that's a part of that. Because you have a believer. Now here's part of the problem. When we become Christian, do we become perfect? When we become followers of Yeshua. We, we've talked about that here too. You know, he is without, uh, like who claims he's without sin is a liar, right? So these teachers are holding on to sins. That's what we'll see in here. They become bought. They're bought. But then they take something like pride. Do they lay that down on the altar? Like we're supposed to. It's not a sin that I have that I'm struggling with and I'm trying to lay that down before God. This is something that I'm not trying to lay down before God. And that's what we'll see as we get a little bit farther in this. Verse 2 says, And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, this is the group choosing to follow the destructive teaching, the way of truth will be blasphemy. So it's saying many will follow. So, I, you know, it's one of those things where you're going, okay, many will follow. I am part of many. You know, I don't want to follow a false teacher, but many will follow. And then the end of that is, then the way of the truth will be blasphemy. I, I can think of an example at work. There's uh, more than one teacher does this, but there's one in, I have in mind that will come in just blaring Christian music as she comes into school. Just blaring it. And she's singing as loud as she can go, you know, along with the music. Just blaring it is coming in. The problem is, when she's dealing with students, there's not anything Christian about that. The things that are being accepted and the things that aren't. And so what you see is, is somebody who's saying, I'm a Christian, yet I'm going to go ahead and do some of these other things. I follow Yeshua, yet I'm going to go do some other things. That's blaspheming God. And if you're, you're aware of what you're doing, you don't want to blaspheme God. Like you're talking your example today. When you found out, you're like, I don't want to blaspheme God. You know, it's like when I find out, I'm, I don't want to do that. Well, if we're following somebody who's following, say, a different Messiah, not the Christ we're talking about, and we're claiming to be followers of Yeshua, and our behaviors aren't following what the Bible says, we're blaspheming God. So this whole warning about watch these teachers, be careful for it. And it goes on. It says, and their greed or covetousness, they will exploit you with false words. And their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. So they, they'll exploit you. You'll see like you know, this mindless, I want to help. You know, you got this preacher that you're following or you're listening to. Let me give them my money because I want to support that. There's nowhere in the scripture where God wants us to be mindless when we follow him. There's, there's, you, you won't find it. We're not supposed to be following with this mindless fanaticism. It's not, hey, everyone, drink God's Kool-Aid. That's false religion, right? That's follow this without thinking religion. God wants us to be processing that. In fact, what does it say? It says, test everything. And the next section is just part of this warning. It says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. So he's saying, if he did this, this is the first warning. The angels, now we don't have a whole lot on angels in the scriptures. You won't find, like, most of it is just people's imagination or going to extra biblical texts. But when he starts saying, he did not spare his angels, which sounds like they had a choice at some point, like we have a choice. They had a choice, and some of them didn't, and God didn't spare them. Some of them chose not to follow God, and He didn't spare them. Kind of like what we have. Now they don't have that choice. We have our choice now. When we are in eternity, then we're not, we don't have to worry about that choice anymore. So it says that He didn't spare the angels. And He goes on, He says, that's only one of His three examples here. If He did not spare the ancient world... But preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, when I first, a lot of people are saying, well, we're talking about God sparing those eight people. True. Evil going on. And during that time, wickedness was rampant. But it's also, this is God's first creation of the world. This is his, you know, this is his baby as far as he makes the earth. And it's the ancient world. It's everything how he wanted it to be. And then... Our wickedness, people's wickedness, messed it up. And then God saved the righteous out of that. But he's willing to destroy all of that and save the righteous. And then the last one, 
If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going on, going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rec rec rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds and s that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who judge in the lust of defiling passion, or that uh, defiling passion is in the lust of uncleanliness and despise authority. I thought, I thought it was kind of an interesting thing when they say, what, of righteous lot? And you know, for, when I think of that story, I don't think of righteousness and lot, but if we remember how he got into that, he was with Abraham, they were following God, Abraham went one way, and because he said, okay, Lot, you choose. Lot chose the rich way, the lush way. These were wealthy. Sodom and Gomorrah were wealthy, successful people. And God didn't spare them, but he did rescue Lot, the righteous, out from that. But he didn't spare the wickedness. And that's what it's saying here. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion. And when it says, and despise authority, that's uncleanliness, and authority. Bold and willful, they, the false teachers, do not tremble as they blasphemy, blasphemy the glorious ones. So they're speaking of heavenly beings and they're blaspheming them. Whereas the angels, through greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. What it's just saying there is that even though God's in charge of everything, God's in charge of judging everybody, God is the one who's in charge here. So whatever the scale is, it's about God. And so God's going to rescue you out of your trials if you're a righteous person. And it goes on. But these, like irrational animals, create an instinct born to be caught and destroyed. So what it's saying is these are like irrational animals. They're not giving everything down to God. They are holding on to something and letting their passions rule them. That's what they are enslaved to, not surrendering it to God. And they're blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, while they feast with you. Now, they had a, when you're talking about believers together, they had a different format. For us, we'd be talking about things we even see online. You know, we're watching them online. They're with us as they're doing it, and they're proud of what they're doing. And where the warning is, don't get sucked into that. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor. They have loved gain from wrong, wrongdoing. But was rebuked for his own transgression, a speechless donkey, spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Balaam's whole thing was he held on to pride and greed. So what you see is these teachers, I mean, how, how do you get your way sometimes? You kind of start complimenting people. And they come back to you, that would prick your pride. And they can pull you into that. I mean, there's all sorts of things as you read through this that you'll see. And they're greed. They're wanting fleshly things. These are, these are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. This waterless springs, meaning you're thirsty and you see a well, that's what they look like. You need rain. There's a storm coming. That's what they look like. What they provide is no water. And you're still thirsty. You might think that you're getting your water, but they're saying there's no water there. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they, ent they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever comes a person, to that he is enslaved. So they're teaching freedom. Now, the freedom is, if you're getting fleshly stuff, you're getting into the world, then in the, in the saying, that's okay, your freedom is, now I don't have to feel so bad that I'm sinning. 
because my preacher's saying it's okay, and now I can do the things I want to do. I want to do those sinful desires in my heart, and now it's okay to do it. And this guy's preaching that. If you get comfortable with the world's definitions of right or wrong, then you can do the wrong, and we know that the wrong is right. And that's what we see there. The sin, though, enslaves them. For if they have, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than to ever then, after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. These are people who have known God and then didn't, they weren't laying things down before God. They got tangled up and started saying, well, if my pride is okay, I'm going to teach you that having pride is okay. You know, I'm going to start talking about having lots of money is okay, or whatever the issue is, the sin that they're holding on to, if I can get everybody else to think it's okay, then it's okay. But he's saying that's what you become enslaved to. And so they're not laying everything down before God. And that's what they continue. He says it's better for them if they'd never have known the way of righteousness, because now they're with nothing. And it finishes with this. What the proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing itself, returns to, the, to wallow in the mire. Now, one of the things that I found confusing when I keep reading this is this is what's the dog's nature is to go back to its vomit. The sow's nature is to go back. That means there was no change to begin with is what you start looking at. But there was this, I, I'm starting reading on that going, okay, how, did, how does that work? Were they ever saved? You know, because now, before it sounded like it said, they were saved, and then they got entangled in their sin. And they taught other people that their sins were okay, and now they're serving themselves. They're not serving God. There was this Jewish expression that kind of paired with this, you know, mikvah, right? When you bathe because you're unclean. They had it for all sorts of stuff, but the, the expression that I'm, I'm going to give you, it was after somebody touched a corpse, and they needed to bathe, to be clean. Well, the expression is, if you go ahead and mikvah, while you're still holding on to the corpse, the mikvah doesn't do you any good. So if you're holding on to the sin, like I say, that somebody who meets with God, but then doesn't lay down the things that they need to lay down. It's not, it's not the stuff that we're struggling with. It's the thing that we see that we should be struggling with, but we, we give that the world view that, oh, that's not such a big thing, even though we know it is. And those are the things we hope to be convicted about. And so it says, what happens is, when you become clean, you can't be clean if you're holding on to the source of the defilement. And that's, that's how I'd explain that last piece. Chapter 3 of Peter ends with Peter telling us to stand firm and remember that all is going on as has been prophesied. Like We're not seeing stuff that wasn't prophesied, that God hasn't given us. He says, like, I, can't, I don't know what verse this is, you might find it. He says, scoffers say, where is God then? Like, okay, we've got, this is how we're supposed to live. We've gotten the warning. And now he's saying, hold true to this. Scoffers say, so where is God? Hasn't everything just been doing the same it's always been? And his response is, okay, since the beginning of creation, you're talking about everything's gone the way it has. And you've totally neglected to realize that everything was created. By who? By God. You're totally ignoring what God has said. He's like, there is a creator. You see him around us. I mean, you just go outside and you can see it. He says, the Lord is not slow to fill, fulfill his promises. Like he said, there would be swift justice to these guys who are doing the evil things. But our idea of swift and God's is different. Why do we have all this stuff? Why is it still the way it is? And he answers it in here. He says, God doesn't want anybody to perish. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. So why do we still have all this pain and this sorrow and things going on the way it is? Why hasn't he come back? Because there's people he still wants that aren't following him. So it's like, oh, you know, where, where's my grumble on that? 
The day of the Lord is coming. Stand firm, that's what he's saying. Yeshua says this in Matthew. He says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. He's talking about the end times. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then, and then the end will come. So Yeshua is even saying, this is going to happen. Stand firm. Don't start following those ways that aren't of God. Go to your Bibles. I want to cl cl conclude this as Peter did in verse 18, chapter 3, verse 18. And this is saying to us, don't, and he's saying, don't get carried away by lawless people, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So our cause is to be praying for discernment and reading our Bibles.